You're listening to uh, You and Yours. It's nearly 12.23 now. Ladies and gentlemen, due to the turbulence, we are suspending all service at this time. Captain, please, that it could last approximately 20 minutes. Please return to your seats and fasten your seatbelts. Now, I suspect you've been here before. The sound of a slightly panicked aircraft cabin as it rattles through the air during a period of turbulence. A new study into the effects of climate change on turbulence suggests that it's only going to get worse as the atmosphere warms up. It suggests the number of incidents like the one we've just heard could increase by at least 40%. Dr Paul Williams is from the University of Reading, which identified the likelihood of increased turbulence. Stephen Draper is a retired British Airways pilot from the British Airline Pilots Association. Uh, Paul Williams, let's start with the basics here. Exactly what are we talking about when we talk about turbulence and why does it happen? Well, the kind of turbulence we've looked at is clear air turbulence. So this is not turbulence that happens when you fly through clouds. That tur- uh, Clouds are a turbulent environment and as you're uh, ascending and descending through clouds, that will be a turbulent experience. But what we've looked at is clear air turbulence, so turbulence above clouds. And what's happening is that wherever you have wind blowing at different speeds in close proximity, so high wind speeds and low wind speeds, perhaps above and below each other, that is an unstable situation and that airflow will tend to break down into turbulence. And why is climate change having a bearing on the likelihood of that happening more often? Well, that's a good question, because mostly when we think about climate change, we think about the fact that it's getting warmer down here at the bottom of the atmosphere where we live. But what is also changing is the basic state of the atmospheric winds 10 kilometres above our heads where planes fly. And, And those jet stream winds, which can easily reach 150 miles an hour, are, are getting stronger and blowing faster because of climate change and that is leading to more of the instability that causes turbulence to form. And Stephen Draper, from the pilot's point of view, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you can't predict when this is going to happen, can you? No, that's right. I mean, we have some idea on some planning charts where turbulence may be, but uh, as it's clearer turbulence, you can't see it from the clouds. So the only the only real indication that we have that there might be turbulence there is by speaking to other pilots that are flying in the same airspace or listening to their updates. And, and that's pretty reliable because if you're given a message sufficiently in advance, you, could, you can make the, the, the required adjustments, can you? That's right. That gives us the opportunity to change our altitude if we, if we can, uh, to avoid the worst of the turbulence. Or uh, sometimes it, it gives us a chance to put the seatbelt signs on early. So it might be perfectly smooth in the cabin and then the seatbelt signs go on. And that's because we've had a little bit of warning from an aeroplane in front that they're encountering some turbulence. As passengers, we don't like it very much, but is it ever dangerous? N- not from an aeroplane's point of view. They're designed to take stresses and strains way beyond any kind of turbulence that's ever been encountered. The only thing you have to be a little bit careful of is is for people moving around the cabin and specifically the cabin crew. Because if you were to encounter severe air turbulence very suddenly uh, and they weren't strapped in, then it can cause problems. And Paul Williams, severe air turbulence is still very rare, isn't it? Uh, it's very rare. Uh, if you look at moderate turbulence, about 1% of airspace at any one time is estimated to contain moderate turbulence. And by moderate, uh, there's a sort of Richter scale of air turbulence, <laughs> a bit like this scale for earthquakes. Um, and it's it's all carefully calibrated. And this moderate turbulence, which is 1% of airspace, is enough to bump the plane up and down by about 10 or 20 feet and cause g-forces of up to 1g. So not quite enough to lift you out of your seat if you didn't have your seatbelt fastened, but getting on for being that strong. Mm. But I do stress it is 1% of airspace, which is very rare indeed. Stephen Draper, what about some of the new aircraft that we're beginning to see more and more frequently? Are they better equipped to cope with all this? Well, yes, new aeroplanes have a couple of different advantages. One of the things is that they can get to their higher cruise altitudes quicker, and that gives you more options in deciding what altitude you want to fly at to avoid the worst of the turbulence. But the design of them as well also makes them uh, have a kind of a softer ride through, through it. And in terms of studies like this, how will this help pilots uh, currently flying, do you believe? Well, I think this is a, this turbulence is forecast over a long-term period. And, and I think one of the things that we probably need to focus on is seeing if we can forecast it a little bit better, because if we're able to forecast it better, then we'll be able to uh, avoid it. Right, and are we close to that, Paul Williams? Uh, we're getting closer. There are methods for forecasting clear air turbulence up to 24 hours in advance. 
and they don't do a bad job. Their accuracy is about 70 or 80 percent, so not quite as good as a weather forecast, but significantly better than um, tossing a coin, for example. <laughs> yes, um, thank you both on that note, uh, Paul Williams and Stephen Draper.